History defines people, how they exist, and what they become. As time passes, people tend to select and retell golden stories as their history, glossing over dark times. Our past is the foundation of our future. Our continued existence depends upon an honest connection with our history. To grow as a people and honor those who have gone before us, we share our stories honestly and remember our native history. Remember that there was a time when uh, the traditional Ute homeland was all over the Rocky Mountain West and into the Great Basin. It was a vast area. And Utes were famous for being uh, traders and business people. The, the settlers and the Utes seemed to get along fairly well in, uh, during the early months of the uh, fort. But uh, I think eventually the Utes began to uh, somewhat regret having the colonists here. And he waged war against uh, Mormon settlers and pushed them out of four counties. Um, several cities were eliminated. Uh, he almost forced the Mormons out of the state of Utah. It's not an incident or a conflict that people want to remember. It was the frontier at its very worst. It has nothing uh, that celebrates our noble ancestors. It's about the gritty realities of history, conflict, life, and death. If, if, though, if these youth do not have a hero that comes from their legacy, that, you know, from their heritage, that they can grab onto and relate to, then it's, they're kind of lost. And I think about myself, and, and uh, I feel sad. I feel sad, and I'm feeling sad now. But I think history has to be remembered for whatever happened. An understanding of the true history is central uh, to the well-being of a community. Um, when it comes to the Black Hawk story, um, if the truth is never told, then um, everyone operates out of myth. No single decisive event marked the beginning of the Black Hawk War in Utah. Historians pawing through the ashes of the past date it from April of 1865. In reality, the spark that set it off flared with the arrival of white settlers in the homelands of the Ute Indians in 1847. For decades, the intensity of the Black Hawk War affected the people of Utah, both native and immigrant, like no other conflict. Friends became enemies, coexistence turned to conflict. Peaceful relationships deteriorated into blood feuds. Through it all, wrote a man known to his people as Nooch, to the Mexicans as Antonga, to the Mormons as Black Hawk. Black Hawk changed history. Through omission and revision, his visionary influence on our past is all but forgotten. His effect on our time unrecognized by many. For over 10,000 years, tens of thousands of indigenous people populated what is now Utah and surrounding states. These Indian nations and their many bands were related through language, culture, and kinship. While there were times of war and conflict, the people were united through a spiritual connection to Mother Earth. While many shared the resources of the Salt Lake Valley, the area served primarily as an unclaimed buffer zone between local tribes. Among the most numerous in the region were the Utahs, or Ute Indians, spread over some 225,000 square miles. The Utes comprised many bands. Arrival of Mormon settlers in Salt Lake Valley in 1847 interrupted life for the Ute people in ways never experienced nor anticipated. Determined to build an independent nation where his Latter-day Saints could find protection from the hostility of the United States. Mormon leader 
Brigham Young immediately launched exploration and settlement parties from his base in the Great Salt Lake Valley. As a result, Utes lost traditional food sources of plants, game, and a productive fishery at Utah Lake. Now Brigham Young officially proclaimed a policy of helping the Indians. He famously said, uh, it's cheaper to feed them than to fight them. Uh, but at the same time, the Mormons are aggressively seizing every water hole, uh, using up the game, uh, consuming the canyons and the timber resources. The Utes faced starvation and were forced to beg for food or steal. They sometimes helped themselves to Mormon cattle, considering it fair compensation for their lost resources. Settlers retaliated, resulting in an attack on an innocent encampment in the hills above Pleasant Grove. During the winter of 1849, some 44 armed militia troops brutally attacked a small camp defended by only one gun. A few Indians survived. Some were taken captive. Among them, a 12-year-old boy who had just witnessed the slaughter of his family, a boy who would become Black Hawk. Difficulties in Utah Valley flared up in Ernst with the establishment of Fort Utah. An incident, an unfortunate incident occurred west of the fort um, in, I think it was about August probably, when uh, three Mormon battalion veterans who had come here to settle met an Indian that the people called Old Bishop. They met him west of the fort uh, while they were hunting and he had on a shirt that had belonged to one of the uh, colonists that was there. Uh, it had been taken off his line. An old bishop discovers these three young men out poaching deer. Uh, he confronts them over, over it. They murder him. Uh, they eviscerate him, fill his stomach cavity with rocks and drop him in the river and tell people that uh, they would caught him with a shirt that he'd stolen from a, a, a wash line and that that's why they murdered him. Tensions between Utes and Mormons in Utah Valley worsen, eventually leading to a bloody siege and battle at Fort Utah. The Utes scattered after the fight and the Nauvoo Legion, the Mormon militia, pursued. Under orders from Nauvoo Legion, Commander Daniel H. Wells, Wild Bill Hickman, forced young Black Hawk into service and the troops followed a trail of blood into the mountains east of the fort. The band, under the leadership of Old Elk, took refuge in Rock Canyon. There, Black Hawk found the frozen bodies of several of his kin that had been wounded at Fort Utah, including his elder, Old Elk. Though still able, had escaped beyond the cliffs. William Wild Bill Hickman of Nauvoo Legion hacked off the head of Old Elk for a trophy and hanged it by its long hair on a cabin at Fort Utah. Meanwhile, other members of the Nauvoo Legion pursued another party of fleeing Utes across the ice of Utah Lake. The militia captured and executed a dozen or more men. Later, the frozen bodies of these victims were decapitated in the supposed interest of science. The traumatic effects of all the violence and brutality on young Black Hawk were lasting. Um, I think those things um, worked on him and, and ate away. And he was developing anger more and more each day. And it was developing into a rage and he was going to eventually get even one way or the other. The Black Hawk War was not a single event. Over 150 brutal confrontations took place between 1849 and 1873. Mormon settlements encroached on Indian homelands at ever increasing rate as thousands of immigrants arrived. Disputes over food, thievery, brutality, and murder accompanied the expansion as individuals and groups on both sides of the conflict clashed. 
more bloody incidents occurred, such as the Mountain Meadows Massacre, in which followers of Brigham Young slaughtered more than 100 innocent travelers, and the Bear River Massacre, where United States Army troops under Colonel Patrick Edward Connor destroyed a Shoshone winter camp and killed some 300 men, women, and children. Regardless of direct involvement or not, such horrifying incidents affected natives and immigrants alike and contributed to growing hatred. Ongoing difficulties between Mormons and the federal government complicated the situation. This conflict between Mormons, Indians, and the American government sets the stage for what happens in the Black Hawk War, how it is fought, uh, why it is so brutal, and how it ends. Black Hawk, like everyone else, must have been affected by their relentless pressure. On April 19, 1865, the Black Hawk War flared up. During negotiations over stolen cattle in San Pete Valley, a drunken interpreter named John Lowry angrily insulted Ute leader Jake Arapine and pulled him by his hair from his horse. Dishonored before his warriors, Arapine suffered the final blow of insults and depredations spanning nearly two decades. The infuriated Utes rallied under the new leadership of Chief Black Hawk, declaring war against the Mormons. He saw his relative yanked from his horse and treated with such disrespect. Um, that was the last straw for him too. And um, he, he, he definitely uh, became determined to, to even the score at that time. So you have a situation by 1865 where a struggle had been going on for almost 20 years. And it was becoming increasingly clear to the Utes that they could either resist or die. Black Hawk over here, regardless of all the treaties and all of that, no, you white people, you're not going to take this. You're not going to take our land. You're not going to change our way. And I'd be right there with him. In the state of Utah, the most formidable leader of all um, during the um, era of conflict with Mormon settlers, uh, during that period it had to be um, Black Hawk, Nooch. Um, he was formidable because he he endured um, the suffering. He saw war, he saw his family um, die, most horrible deaths. He was part of that. For more than three years, Black Hawk and his allies launched guerrilla raids against Mormon settlements throughout Utah. It's very difficult to deal with what is truly a series of small atrocities, a border war. A, a war between neighbors and people who lived with each other and knew each other very well. Uh, a war between young men who'd grown up with a lot of Indian friends or a lot of Mormon friends. And that's what makes this history so painful. That's why the Black Hawk War is so difficult for both Indians and Mormons to remember. Black Hawk not only led Utes from many bands in the fight as a skillful leader, he negotiated participation by men from several tribes, including Paiute, Diné, Apaches, and the Shoshone. Native raiders wrestled vast herds of cattle and horses from the settlements, and Black Hawk kept a network of trails lively, flooding the market with surplus animals to other tribes and Mexican traders, eventually collapsing cattle market prices throughout the territory. Some 200 whites and 600 Indians were killed in the fighting. It is said that smallpox, measles, and starvation killed off 90% of the native population. Although Black Hawk fought bitterly, 
the warrior ultimately confronted the horrors befalling his people. As their homeland succumbed to ever-increasing numbers of settlers, Black Hawk's unwavering loyalty to his people compelled him to secure their survival through a dramatic change in tactics, total peace with the white man. Again, it was white history that wrote it, that he surrendered and no, man like that don't surrender. He'll come to terms with reality. I'm done. We're done. We, we did what we could. And uh, we're done. But yet, it gets written differently. And in 1870, deathly ill from a bullet wound he received a year earlier at Gravelly Ford, Black Hawk pursued peace with the same tenacity as he had waged war. He traveled 180 miles to every Mormon village he had attacked to personally apologize for the pain and suffering he and his warriors had caused. You didn't see that on the part of the other, <laughs> uh, the settlers. So it took a greater man to do such a thing. And that is what is overlooked when history is not told accurately. Black Hawk pleaded for forgiveness between whites and Indians and an end to the bloodshed. Early settlers referred to this journey as Black Hawk's mission of peace. And like any of us, I think you get to a point to where, well, it's like war, any war. You get in, you do what you gotta do. And maybe there's a family there and you've killed kill their kids. You as a human, that, that thing that we all are, is going to at least make you say, I'm sorry. And he finally makes his way um, back to his um, homeland, uh, Spring Lake, um, the place where he was born. And that is the place where he, he passes on out of this world. His work is complete. He has fought the good fight, and he has ended his life in peace. But Black Hawk's journey had not yet ended. Forty years later, his remains are dug up, and they're displayed in a hardware store for about two weeks. Later, they're taken to uh, Salt Lake City, and they're retained in uh, LDS Church headquarters for another 60 years. In 1996, Black Hawk's remains returned to Spring Lake, but it took an act of Congress and the humanitarian efforts of a National Forest Service archaeologist and a Boy Scout. Once we had established that Black Hawk had been buried on land that later became National Forest Land, we knew that NAGPRA, or the Native American Graves Protection and Repatri Act, Repatriation Act would apply in this case. And that set a whole series of other things in motion. And I was still going to school at this time, and so I kept tabs with Charmaine to figure out what was going on. And it was ongoing for two or three or four months of the church museum had to the BYU museum had it. Nobody knew exactly where they were located at. Nobody knew. And it was frustrating me, it was frustrating Charmaine. No one expected much of a crowd that windy day when Black Hawk's remains finally regained the respect of a hollowed resting place. More than 500 attended. One of the reasons that so many people came to Black Hawk's funeral was not only because he's a well-known historical figure, but because a lot of people who live in this area are the descendants of the folks who fought against Black Hawk and his men. They, too, are looking for closure. And it was so wonderful to see the descendants of the folks who fought against Black Hawk shaking hands with the descendant of Black Hawk himself. And so all that grieving needs for all of us to come together to do that. Like I said, as we stand by ourselves, it's easy to break us. But if we all come together and put all our gifts together, the grieving process is gonna be much easier for all of us. 
and we can wipe away all of our tears. Descendants of the Utes still suffer continuing effects of demoralization, lingering sorrow, forgotten history, spiritual damage, and ever-shrinking homelands, all lost to racial prejudice. Today, they struggle to preserve a vanishing language vital to their cultural survival. I think one of the things that's uh, really hard about maintaining or revitalization of, of a language is that you have to have the commitment. Um, a person has to make the commitment to learn the language. A person has to make a commitment to teach the language. Um, that has to be there. Otherwise, it doesn't survive or it doesn't ma get maintained or it doesn't get revitalized. It, it dies a slow death. Uh, I don't want to see that happen. Despite it all, the you people survive and endure and continue in many ways to come to terms with the past to remain Ute. We took from them almost all their land. The reservations are just a, a tiny remnant of traditional tribal homelands. We tried to take from them their hunting rights, their fishing rights. Uh, the timber on their land. We tried to take from them their water rights. We tried to take from them their culture, their religion, their identity. And perhaps most importantly, we tried to take from them their freedom. And what is so amazing about this whole story is that we failed. We failed after hundreds of years of trying to take everything from American Indians, we failed to do that, they're still here. And their survival, that great saga of survival is one of the great stories of all mankind.